Um, okay, so um, my name's Tony Temple. You may have worked out I don't come from America. I come from England. And um, I have the misfortune of owning the current world record on missile command tournament settings. Um, this is a picture of my Guinness certificate. Uh, which they uh, sent through to me. Uh, this represents the first time I broke the record in 2006, and I've subsequently increased my record uh, once in 2009, uh, live at Fun Spot in New Hampshire, and again in 2010, uh, which I did by DVD, and again doubled my world record, so it now stands at 4.4 million points. Uh, so this is what Guinness sends you, and um, you know, it's all very flattering and very nice, but I'm, I, I sort of try and keep a level head about it all, and obviously being, um, being British, the, the sort of stiff upper lip thing comes into play, and I, I often find I, I don't have to introduce myself to anyone as a world record holder, because other people seem more excited than I am. There's kind of a bizarre dynamic that people will say, oh, have you met Tony? By the way, he holds a world record, which is not really, I, yeah, it's not really something I would do. Um, but it's very nice and very nice to be recognized. I, I framed it up on the right-hand side there um, with a cover of the book and a missile command marquee, and I, I, I brought it home in a very proud moment and showed my wife. The only place she would let me hang it was in the downstairs toilet. <laughs> so I, she kind of, you know, I was hoping it would go in the lounge or the hallway or, you know, maybe have a missile command shrine, but it, it, she wasn't having any of it. So it, it, it's in the downstairs loop, which, which makes an interesting conversation piece, I guess. I wanted to talk a bit about, rather than just talk about how to play missile command, the, the backstory of missile command is so fascinating and interesting. I just, if you can bear with me, I thought it'd just be worth spending five minutes talking about that. Missile Command was designed by a guy called Dave Toyer, who was also responsible for several other uh, Atari games, which you may be familiar with. His first game was four-player soccer. He then worked on Missile Command. He then worked on Tempest, of course, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. Uh, and then iRobot on the top right there, which was the first, I think I'm right in saying, the first arcade game to feature polygon graphics. Quite an achievement, way ahead of its time. And then Dave's final game, bottom right, which was APB, um, I've spoken to Dave about the games he, uh, he, he wrote, and he tells me that APB just brings back so many bad memories. He, he wasn't a fan of working on the game. It took far too long. Uh, he thought there was far too much thrown in there for a, for a casual arcade experience. But it's actually a great game. It's actually really quite deep, and, um, and you guys should uh, try and check it out. So Missile Command was, um, the idea of Missile Command came up in 1979, so David just finished four-player soccer. Um, and whilst he didn't lead the programming, I think um, much like Warren's uh, experience at Gottlieb, it was time for him to step up to the plate and write a game of, of his own. Um, the, the story is told several different times, but according to Dave, his boss, a guy called Lyle Rains, who was the head of engineering, came to him with a press cutting, and in that press cutting it talked about uh, missiles and radars. And the idea he dropped into Dave's head was, you've got these missiles coming in and there's a radar sweeping the screen and you've got to pr protect you know, the world at the bottom of the screen. And Dave came away very excited, and he, he, he said literally the hairs on the back of his head stood up. Uh, this is the actual design document, the idea that Dave uh, drew. And supporting that is an additional document with, with lots of interesting writing on it. If You can Google this, it's actually online. Um, but this was the original design document, and you can probably make out there the basics of missile commands. You've got... A, a, a land mass at the bottom. You can see there are missiles coming down. Uh, you can see the little crosshair there, bottom left, um, and, a, and, a, and a missile shooting up to intercept the missile. The V shape, which you see, was supposed to be the, uh, the radar. And they initially thought about having a radar, that the radar sweeps the screen. But he said it was just crazy, because obviously, as you will know, in a radar, it sweeps the screen, 
everything on the left-hand side disappears until it comes around and sweeps again. And he said it, it, it just didn't work. It was an early idea, um, but they pulled it from the game. There were other things in the game which were removed. Um, in fact, the whole thing at the bottom of the screen was an ecosystem. So you can see the, the graphic on the bottom, obviously, is from the game, the, the, the yellow landmass in the background there. Initially, there were trains. There were trains delivering missiles to your bases. Uh, there was a thought of submarines, and the intention initially was the whole thing to be a, a working ecosystem. So if your train got blown up, there were no more missiles going to the, uh, to the bases. And the cities, you know, the, 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 uh, the missiles were created in a city, so if you lost a city, the, the missiles wouldn't be created so, so fast. Massively complicated and clearly, you know, a very early version of the game. They tried to make that work, but again, the feeling was it was far too complicated. This is another original design document. Um, I got hold of this from a guy called Mike Jang, who was an industrial uh, engineer, an industrial designer at, um, at Atari. Dave and his team gave him a brief, told him what the machine was about, and this was the initial drawing they came up with. Um, I want to talk about that huge marquee attract panel that you can see there at the top, which was sketched out. Again, this is another original Atari design document. This was the original design of the cabinet. And the, the large marquee which you see at the top, um, again, that's the original, the, the original handwritten, uh, hand-drawn sketch. And this marquee um, was actually integral to the gameplay. This is what it would have, would have looked like on top of a cabinet. Um, and each light represents something in the game. So when your missiles came down beyond halfway, there would be a warning light would, would flash up and you would hear a warning sound. And similarly, when your bases go low, you may, if you're familiar with the game, you get an audible beep, beep, beep to tell you you've only got three missiles left. That audio cue was there, but also you would see a light come up in the top of the marquee. So picture, if you will, you're trying to play the game Missile command is getting faster. You're focusing in on the game. And you've got to look at this thing. You need to interpret these lights and look at the screen. That's the only photograph that we know of of the cabinet, perhaps. But maybe not. Or maybe there is a cabinet out there. Who knows? I couldn't possibly say. So you can imagine trying to play the game and looking up trying to in interpret the data up there and then looking back down on the screen. It was very clear, very quickly, very early on that in playtesting, this was not gonna work. You couldn't look up and look at the screen and, and try and interpret both. So what did they do? They, they brought the machine back to Atari, they grabbed Mike and in a meeting room they said, we need to do something, this isn't gonna work. So Mike was sent away to come up with a solution and again, this is one of Mike's original documents. What he decided to do was to just chop the whole thing off and pull all of that bit of the code that was on the PCB out of the PCB, chop the thing down, let's just remove it. And you can see those red lines there. Um, you can make out what is a missile command cabinet with the topper removed. Mike sat down with his pens quickly came up with something, said, what do you think of this, guys? And they decided that was the way to go. Dave, speaking to Dave, he was quite happy because it, it removed an enormously sort of complex part of the game. He thought programming the whole top thing was a complete pain in the backside. He wasn't a fan of it. He was actually glad it, it was removed. And of course, management were pleased because it saved a whole bunch of money. And so, Missile Command became what we know to be Missile Command. Uh, it, so it went from, went from that and ended up being that. Um, a lot of people come to me and they say, I don't know how you can play that game with the crazy control panel. There's this trackball, there's no joystick, it's a trackball, it's obviously analog, so similar to your 
PlayStation or your Xbox controller, the further you, or the faster you move, the further you move the controller, the faster the, 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 your cursor or your character will move on screen. Missile Command is exactly the same thing. So think of, um, think of a trackball as an upturned mouse. You know, you, you, you can move your cursor across the screen. Missile Command works in exactly the same way. Interestingly, uh, the trackball was initially designed for the Canadian Navy, and uh, they used it as a device, funnily enough, relating to a, a radar where they would want to move things around on a screen. Um, a guy called Jerry Lyacek from Atari, who again was a, a, an industrial engineer, he came up with their first um, trackball design with the with the rollers and the trackball sits on top of it. The trackball is actually a Canadian candle pin. I, I don't know what a candle pin is, but it's a game, it's like a bowling game. It's, it's essentially a bowling ball. So if you ever want to replace your trackball on a missile command, just go and find someone who sells Canadian sized uh, uh, yeah, balls and you can have it. And on the left-hand side, you've got your three control bu buttons, which control the missiles which fire up from your three bases. Um, interestingly, this is what attracted me to the game, and many people were, were put off. It actually drew me to the game. It was just so complex and so different to anything that I'd seen before. Uh, so as well as the standard upright, which you can see, there were other uh, versions of Missile Command released. There's a cabaret version, which uh, is on the left-hand side there a cocktail version where players sit on opposite sides, and then the beast, the thing on the right-hand side, the Missile Command cockpit. Um, estimates vary, but we think 150 were released, and inevitably the vast majority of them were smashed up when they'd had their day. But there were a few still around. There was one here last year at the show. Um, I would say there's more in America than in the UK. We never saw it as a release in the UK, but I do know one guy who, uh, one guy who owns one over in the UK. The game's reception was huge. It was a big hit for Atari. Uh, as I said, 14,000 upright cabinets sold. Uh, this is Steven Spielberg, who was a big uh, fan of uh, classic arcade games in general, but specifically Missile Command. And um, there's a great story uh, which is told by the guy, the guy who wrote Ready Player One, and he obviously spoke to Steven Spielberg as part of the film, and obviously talked to him off the record about his fascination with video games. And um, there was a story going around, and apparently it's absolutely true. During the filming of E.T., Stephen was so obsessed with cracking a million points on Missile Command that he brought the cabinet to the set in the woods as they filmed E.T., and sure enough, actually cracked a million points on Missile Command during the filming of E.T., which is, which is just great. Um, so you guys over here obviously had your own launch of Missile Command, I guess, and, and, and I'm sure you've got your own views of when we were all young and what, what the whole nuclear threat meant. And I, I just thought I'd show you this. Um, this is a document called Protect and Survive and was released by the British government supposedly to reassure its citizens about what to do should a nuclear attack occur. And it's got amazing gems in it. And I, I specifically remember in 1980, we had, this document came through, our, came, came through our letterbox. And I grabbed it and I sat and I studied it. And I had this big fear of Russia and America and you know, Brezhnev, Gorbachev, Reagan. And there's these guys on the telly and the, the Russian guys marching along and the big green missiles and the parades and as we see in North Korea now, it, it, Russia used to do that and it would be beamed into our homes and you'd hear a jet in the middle of the night and you'd think, this is it. And I, I was 12 and I can it, it was a constant gut thing that we, I, we just all thought, we, you know, now it's terrorism, back then it was nuclear war and we, we, it was a genuine fear. And I'd read this document and it had great stuff in it like, you know, if you lived on the fifth floor of an apartment block, you, you should probably find somewhere else to go because that probably wouldn't be a great place to stay should the bombs come. And I had things like um, grab a mattress, lean it against a wall, an interior wall, then take the doors off of your house. So you imagine you get the, you know, the 10 minute warning, the bombs are coming, oh, okay, well, I need a screwdriver, I'm undoing my doors. It was just ridiculous, it was just so funny, but all of that was there and it was all in the background and of course that all played into why I was drawn to 
to miss our command. Again, I just thought this is worth mentioning. Uh, this is a whole other presentation, I'm sure, but in 1983, Reagan's great, um, did you guys call them State of the Union addresses? Yeah. You know, some, so he talked on camera and talked about the Star Wars program, which again I thought was really interesting. And I thought, well, this is a Dave Toyer already did the Star Wars program, man. You, you, can shoot, you could shoot missiles out of the sky with, with missile command. So I, I, I wouldn't possibly claim that missile command, you know, inspired Reagan to come up with the idea of the Star Wars program. But I, I, I just thought it, it, it was an interesting connection. So 14,000 of these things rolled out over here in the US and, and went into your arcades, and I'm sure you guys will know far better than I what your arcades were like. Big, colorful places. Places like the Time Out arcades. I mean, I just, you know, this is where you want to go. Big colors, big lights, loads of machines, excitement, awesome. This is where you go, it's an event. You being very social, these huge, great chains of, you know, glorious arcades. I had Rita's Cafe. Rita's Cafe was a grim, downtrodden, dark, horrible place. You probably would get salmonella poisoning if you ate there. But this was my, this is where I discovered Miss Command. Um, and Rita's Cafe was in between my school and my house. And I was walking home one day and looked across. And you couldn't see in because the steam was rolling down the inside of the of the windows, it was all steamed up. But there was this neon glow inside, and I, I curiously just sort of stuck my head through. And I, I saw these screens lined up, and I thought, that looks interesting. And I had a stripy blazer on, I was 12, 13, and I, I walked in, and like the scene from American Werewolf in London, the whole place stopped, and everybody turned and looked at me, and there were these you know, construction workers, and, and removal men and builders and mechanics, these guys with you know oil on their hands just kind of stopped and stared at me and then kind of carried on as if nothing had happened. Uh, this is where I discovered, um, this is where I discovered Missile Command and interestingly this picture, I found it online and the guy gave me permission to use it. The, the guy sticking out the door, it was a guy called Peter and he was, he was Greek and he, every, everything was cash obviously and it was all in his pockets. He had no till. If you wanted a cup of tea or you wanted some change for the machine, You'd go to Peter, you'd give him a pound note, and he would put his hand, massive hands, big pile of coins, and he would put them in your hand and put it all back in. He clearly never paid any taxes. Um, it was just a, you know, it was just a cash um, job. The most amazing thing about this picture, aside from finding it about two years ago and, and coming across it, is if you look closely in the left-hand window, It's the bloody machine. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, the, the chances of that picture, someone taking a picture of that innocuous place, but actually you can see through the window that is the Missile Command machine that I played when I was 12 years old. It's there. I was just so pleased to, to have found it. So what of the final game? Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with... Uh, Missile Command, at least I hope you are, but in case you're not, you have six cities across the bottom of the screen. Uh, represent, you just about make them out there in blue. Well, you can't, you have to look at the graphic along the bottom. You also have three missile bases. Each missile base has ten missiles, and your job is to protect your cities at the bottom of the screen from the incoming missiles, which are streaming down, as you can see there. It's an interesting point here. Um, Dave Toyer was very, very clear with Atari management that he would only work on the game if the purpose of the game was to defend and not to attack. He didn't want any part of any game which, you know, incited any kind of, you know, America is aggressively going after, you know, other nations. And it was all about protecting and saving, uh, you know, what, what you needed to protect, which in this case was uh, cities. And so the missiles get progressively faster, as you can see. You move your trackball around, you shoot missiles out of the sky. It gets faster, it gets more fun. That's the idea of the game. So who are the guys who play Missile Command today? Um, well, it's worth pointing out there are two sets of players. There are marathon players, 
Marathon settings on Missile Command means you get six cities to start with, but the key to marathon playing is you get a bonus city at every 10,000 points. The guy at the bottom is a guy called Victor Alley, and he allegedly ha held the marathon world record for, for many years. I think he said it in 1985. The record was 81 million points, which represented 56 hours of play. 56 hours, just e extraordinary. The guy top left, you may have seen, a guy called Bill Carlton. He's, he's a lovely guy, and he was the star of a documentary called High Score. And it chronicled his just constant attempts to beat Victor Alley's score, which had been set for, that, for, for, for such a long period of time. The difficulty Bill was having was the game kept resetting, and he couldn't work out why. You know, was it a hardware issue? Was it a software issue? And eventually they worked out what the issue was, and it's all to do with 256 again, uh, Warren, which you spoke about yesterday um, so interestingly. So if you get good enough at Missile Command on marathon settings, you can in theory play the game forever, because all you need to do is score another 10,000 points, you're going to get another life or another city. And what you can do in Missile Command is build up enough bonus cities in reserve in the background to walk away for 15 minutes or have a sleep or get something to eat, come back to the game and carry on. The challenge is keeping an eye on how many bonus cities you have in reserve. If that count goes beyond 256, it resets to one. So you might think, okay, I think I'm gonna go to the loo now for, or have, some, have, a, have a power nap for 10 minutes. I think I've got 250 or so bonus cities in reserve. If you've miscounted or you've got that wrong and you've actually only got 10, you've blown it. It's all over. Um, and that's difficult, and if you think about it, it's not just about adding 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 every time you get 10,000 points. As you're playing the game, you're losing cities, so some of that reserve is getting paid into your game. So you might have earned a bonus city, but you might have lost three, so actually that's not plus 1, that's plus 1 minus 3. So you're trying to play the game, you're trying to add this up in your head, I, I, yeah. who knows. In addition to that, every 256 waves after wave 256, the difficulty of the game resets. And I'm not entirely sure of the mathematics, but if those two events occur at the same time, if you hit screen 256, which interestingly also gives you 200, everything is worth 256 times what it's normally worth. If all of those things occur at the same time, oh, and there's also the 810,000 point bug. If you hit 810,000 points, in Missile Command, it throws something like 136 bonus cities all at once for you for some reason. So, if you're on screen 256 and you score an enormous amount of points, which you will because everything is worth 256 points its value, and that rolls you over 256 bonus cities in reserve, and it makes you cross 810,000 points, all of those things cause a perfect storm and the game resets. You tell me, I, I have no ideas, I have no idea. However, there, there's a lot of maths involved and um, uh, Bill, guy on the left, and the guy on the right, Victor Sandberg from Sweden. Victor worked out a clever computer program to easily track all of this. At the end of every wave, he pushed a button representing whether he's lost a city, lost two cities, lost three cities, gained a city, and he was able to keep track of all of these things. And they do something called dumping. So you play for a while, play for an hour, and then you sit back and just let the game kill off your cities. You don't do anything. Go and have a sleep, have something to eat, whatever. And I think it was 2012, Bill Carlton finally, not Bill Carlton, sorry, Victor Sandberg, the guy on the right, Victor from Sweden, finally cracked Victor Alley's 30-year-old world record. And he scored over 100 million points off of one quarter, which is just astonishing. Um, and afterwards, it, it was interesting, Victor spoke about, you know, what the game did to him after playing for that long, and he, he said, he was basically hallucinating, he, he was in a sort of half dream awake state, and he spoke about just the shapes in the room, and the, he wasn't really sure what he was doing anymore, he was just kind of losing his mind, and I'm not surprised, you know, after two hours of play. So people got good at Missile Command, and what that meant 
when it comes to tracking high scores, it's a very difficult thing to do because who wants to sit and watch six people play Missile Command for two days? It's, you know, there's not many people out there who, who do it. So, of course, our, our, everybody's favourite high school keeper, Walter Day, came up with a concept called Tournament Settings. And Tournament Settings gives you six cities to start, but you get no bonus cities. Once your cities are gone, your cities are gone. It's all over. Um, and it's interesting, there's a subtle difference between playing marathon settings and tournament settings. Because in marathon settings, somewhere in the back of your mind, you know, well, all I've got to do is hit the next 10,000 point marker, and I've got a bonus city. So it's cool, it's fine. It doesn't matter really what happens on screen. As long as I score 10,000 points, a bonus city comes along, I'm going to continue my game. And whether you like it or not, that's there. And it's interesting comparing a tournament player to a marathon player, because the tournament player guys are just that microsecond more accurate, they're just a little bit more precise, because you've got to be. There's no second chances. Once your six cities are gone, they're gone. It, the, the game is finished. And so that's why tournament setting scores are significantly less than uh, marathon settings. Thank God, because it, it, I, I like the intensity of tournament settings. It's hardcore. Once it's over, it's over. So the world marathon setting score, as I just said, is over 100 million points. Tournament settings, 4 million points. It took about three hours for me to uh, get that. These are the guys still playing tournament mode. Handsome chap on the left you might recognize. Uh, the guy in the bottom is a guy called Jay Askey, who lives in Canada. I, I was fortunate enough to visit him last year. Been talking to him online for years, and we, we finally got it on. I went to his house, and we played some missile commands. Just awesome, awesome player. Uh, Jay can score uh, somewhere approaching 2 million points now, which is great. So he's kind of snapping at my heels a bit. Um, he's, he's an awesome player. The guy top right is a guy called Jeff Blair. He lives in Maine. Uh, Jeff scores can score 1.8, 1.9 million points, I think, on a good day. The guy on bottom right, how much time do you have? This yeah. is there's a guy called Roy Schilt. Uh, Roy was the guy whose record I beat, and his score stood for something like 25 years. Just Google, just Google Roy Schilt. I, you will find everything you need to know on Google. Roy is a very, right. Roy is a, a very, very colorful character. And um, uh, yeah, just Google him. What was that? I think he might have actually, yeah. He's certainly, he certainly got a YouTube channel. Yeah, he certainly, he certainly got a YouTube channel. You know, search for Roy Schilt on YouTube at your peril. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, you know, Roy, I'm sure, is a great guy. I would love to meet him one day. I'm quite sure we're going to have a beer and let bygones be, be bygones. But I, you know, just a just a quick story. I, the first time I went to the, uh, the Fun Spot tournament in 2006, I turned up as the uh, as the British guy, and you know, people were coming up to me and saying, "Oh, hey, you're Tony. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming over." And one by one, people were coming up, and this guy came up to me and said, hey, are you Tony Temple? I said, yeah, nice to meet you. I thought it was just another American guy saying hello, and I shook his hand, and he said, hey, you're the, aren't you the Missile Command guy? I said, yeah, that's right. He said, and you beat a world record, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Roy, Roy, was it Roy? I said, yeah, Roy Schultz. Said, that's right, yeah, Roy Schultz. And he was playing a, you know, an amazing part, and I was just a bit, it was, it was just something off about it. And I said, sorry, who did you say you were? And he said, oh, my name's Larry. And I was, I, I was just passing, and I just thought I'd pop in to see what's going on here. So you're just passing to see what's going on here, but you know I'm some random guy from the other side of the Atlantic, and you pick me out. So it's just a bit strange. So I sort of made my excuses, and off I went. And I, I was playing a game of Space Invaders or something, and I looked up. And he was on the other side of the arcade. So imagine this room. He was on the, right on the other side of the room, stood on a chair with a zoom lens, like a paparazzi camera, pointing at me, taking my picture. And I was like, why, why, if this guy wants to take my picture, why doesn't he just come up to me and take, why is he sort of zooming in from the other side of it? Anyway, long story sideways, Todd, Todd Rogers, who's in the next room, um, uh, said, said to me, he t it, turned out he was, um, it turned out he was a private investigator. Roy Schilt, who lived in Los Angeles, had hired this guy, a private investigator from Boston, to come to Funspot Arcade to find me and like scope me out. Oh, he served me with some papers as well. He served me with this written document from Roy, basically saying, 
he's the true champion, I'm a fraud, I, I'm, playing on the, I'm playing on the wrong settings, it's a whole other story. Uh, it was just bizarre, like he sort of went, oh, Tony, this is for you from Roy, and I just held my hand out. Always a mistake, I'll, I'll, I'll know that for if I ever do get served, I'll know for next time. I just took it, and I thought, what? You just, what have you just served me with something? And he said, this from Roy. And I, said, I thought you didn't know Roy, so then it all came out. So Todd physically removed this guy from, um, from the Fun Spot ar Arcade. And that was just the start. That was my first, the long hands from, from, from Roy. I got to my hotel, and there were five written messages from him. The hotel owner said the phone had been going all night in the middle of the night, with Roy ringing, trying to find me. And it's a whole book in itself. But for the record, I like Roy. Roy, I like you. It's fine. It's, it's okay. So I thought I'd share some. Um, this is some gameplay footage from a world record, my world record game. This this would be I don't know, three million four hundred thousand points. You can see the situation we're in. I have one city left, um, just to the left of the middle base, and that would typically be the the, the city I would try to keep. As great as it, as it would be to protect six cities forevermore, it's just not possible. You, 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 it's going to get you. So one by one, your cities are going to go, and you'll end up with, you know, you're, you're near the end. I have one city left, and I'm just trying to protect that city, make sure that city's safe, because that's all I've got. As soon as that city's gone, the game is over. I, I get um, some... Well, I, I don't suppose it, it's, it's criticism because I hold the world record, but I, I, I get some mickey taking from my fellow players and um, they call it Tony trouble. And I, I, I have this habit of, of letting things come down really low. Many of the other players, they have an imaginary line on the screen about halfway up and they try to make sure they, they take everything out before it gets into the danger zone, which is obviously closer to your, to your city. So they will try to take everything out as soon as it appears on screen, as soon as it goes. I, I, whereas I'm, I'm looking for convergences, so I don't know if you can spot it there. I shot one missile up, but I took three offensive things down. So I'm looking at ways of preserving my missiles. I'm not a one missile, one missile shot player. I will try to uh, you see there, stuff's gonna, it's not, uh, there, there. You see, and in my mind's eye, I can see these two things coming like this. If I shoot here, it's gonna take them both out. And that's what I'm trying to do. And in order to do that effectively, you have to let things come low down on the screen. Um, and so that, that's why I play my game pretty low down as opposed to, as opposed to high up. Warren Davis, do you have a question? Everything's completely random. No two uh, situations are alike. So it's it's all instinct and I, I guess skill. So you you just have to it, it will throw a scenario at you and you have to work out how how to how to deal with it. So uh, I, if it's worth pointing out as well as the standard missiles which are represented by lines. You've also got planes and satellites which come along on the side. Those diamond shaped things are called smart bombs and they try everything they can to avoid your explosions. There's some AI built into them and they will try to go around your explosions. So you think about it, you need to, you need to think about trajectory, speed, how fast is that thing coming down? What angle is it coming down? How fast is my missile going to come up to intercept it? And you need to, uh, I guess, just calculate all of that in your mind, shoot your missile up, take care of it, and then um, move on to something else. Um, if I could give you guys any tips, uh, the most important tip I could give you is just don't panic. Um, far too often I, I, I watch play, people play Missile Command and it's just a flurry of activity on the control panel when they're mashing the buttons and oh my god, I need to send three missiles up and just blah, blah, blah. that your game, you're not gonna, you just need to relax and um, chill out. You, I do, you probably can't pick it up from this footage, but 
Missile Command is a very rhythmic game. And you get into the zone, which Bill Mitchell doesn't believe in, which is not true, Builder is a zone. And you zone out, and you will find that, that there's like an internal rhythm to the game. It's boom, 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 track, boom, track, and you just get into that. And when something throws it, when you lose a base or a missile or the button misfires, or, uh, you, you kind of wake up and go, whoa, 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 and then panic to kind of re recover and then get back into the rhythm. It's, it's, it's just a very, um, a very rhythmic game, I find. There's also peripheral vision. So um, fire and forget. So if I've got something on the left-hand side of the screen, I've spotted it. Um, again, you watch other players trying to learn the game, and they will move the trackball and they'll look at the crosshair and they'll press the button and they'll wait make sure yeah I've done that oh my god something's happened over here no, no, no. Um, if, you, if you're going to play the game to a high standard you need to just um, look at the screen in the round you're looking at the centre of the screen in the corner of my eye I know there's a missile on the right hand side um, obviously because I'm experienced my hand will move the right amount I'll press the button, and I, I know I've dealt with it. I don't have to watch. I don't have to look at it. I don't have to be sure it, it, the, the, the danger has been intercepted. I just know it's going to go. And, and you can probably see watching this footage, you don't have time to watch and wait and just make sure something's gone. I, I just trust my hands, and I, 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 I trust the calculations I've made in my head that I'm, I'm dealing with everything on the screen. But really, I'm just looking at that one spot right there in the middle. I'm not looking anywhere else. That's Missile Command. Uh, world record, 4.4 million points. Took about three hours um, of intensive, constant play. Um, the, the world record score is the only time the kill screen, the screen 256, has been documented in tournament mode. So we weren't sure what was going to happen, whether it was built in. We knew it was there in marathon mode. Um, so you get to screen 255, um, and it, you can't, I'm sorry, this is the other way around. Screen 255, everything is worth 256 times its normal value. So it's worth playing, because there's a big, big chunk of points to get there, which you can do. Screen 256, you can't play. It just gives you automatic bonus points. It will give you the usual bonus for your uh, remaining missiles which in that case would be 30 because you can't play the screen and it will give you your bonus city uh, bonus points, but they're worth 256 times what they're normally worth. And then screen 257, it, everything resets apart from the score. So the difficulty goes back to the start, which was great. I could just stretch my legs, stand up, have a bit of a walk around. Um, uh, just a final point, I'm conscious I'm, um, we're almost out of time. Um, what was I gonna say? No, it's gone. Sorry. No, gone. Stay good. Right, not in tournament mode. No, nothing at all. So you'll, all you get are six cities and you don't get any more. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So again, in tournament mode, Obviously, it's all about scoring, and so ideally, you want to keep six cities for as long as you can because you're going to rack up a bonus at the end of every screen um, the longer you hang on to them. Um, I'd say the best I've done, I've, I've hung on to six cities at half a million without losing a city, um, and I think the best I've done is I've ran about 800,000, I've still had two. Um, and that's great, so that's a great accelerator to start your, your points, you know. So. Yeah, I'm normally crashing out of the game, to be honest. If, if it's a, a world record attempt, I, I, I just know if it's the city on the right-hand side, I'm just not going to be able to uh, uh, do it. So I, I would typically have the city bottom left. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I was, um, I was the first guy certainly in the cafe that I mentioned earlier to um, do that. And um, I remember there was a bit of a crowd watching and I was 
task and we, we had the thing about resetting it to, to zero and we thought I was going to be the first guy to do that. So I'm playing and playing and playing. And the guy, Peter, the, um, sorry, you guys would have missed this, but the, the guy, this guy here, sorry. This is where I played Missile Command in England, Rita's Cafe. The guy sticking his head out the door was the cafe owner, a guy called Peter. He was a Greek guy, huge, big guy. And he loved the machines, obviously, because they earned him an absolute fortune. And I was playing the game. I hit 810,000 points. And out of nowhere, all these cities appeared. And everyone went, whoa. And I went, whoa, whoa what's just happened? I've never seen it before. Is something? And Peter, rasp, I've never seen him run so fast. Huge guy, ran over. He saw what had happened and smacked the power out there and switched it off. And I was like, what are you doing? But he said, me, you, you, you broke my machine. You broke, broke my machine. My machine is broken. What, what, what are you doing? You know. So he was kind of expecting smoke to come out of the back, but of course there was no smoke. And I guess we didn't know what a, what a bug was um, in those days. But he was sure that I destroyed his machine because I would play it. And he, he wasn't a fan of me anyway, because obviously when I put a coin in, no one else could because I was playing the thing all day. Um, but yeah, Peter was quite the character. Yeah. Hello, Walter. Hi. Just in case some of you don't realize it, <clears throat> Missile Command <clears throat> is one of a handful of games that are so good and so challenging that someday when they really do a contest of multi-games, like maybe a 10-game ch championship, to try and truly define a person's skill set Missile Command would be one of those games, along with Robotron, Missile Command, probably Centipede, so you know, test that kind of trackball performance. But so Tony's performance uh, is truly, you know, on a major level, because Missile Command is on a major level. So some people only casually experience Missile Command, so they may not realize how significant of a game it is. But when finally they get around to truly determine the best players of all time and they choose a, 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 you know, a, a phalanx of games, Missile Command will be one of those games. So let's hear it for Tony. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming.